All information contained in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider your individual circumstances. You should consider the appropriateness of this information with regards to your individual objectives, financial situation and needs. Welcome to Sharing More Than The Sheets, a podcast to help you and your partner make better financial and lifestyle decisions so that you can both focus on the things that you love. I'm your host, Michael Curry, financial planner, green thumb, husband, and just dad. This episode is part of a health series where I invite experts from the health industry to come and talk about things that we should all be aware of and most likely do ourselves. I believe that people treat their money just like they treat their health and that our greatest asset is our health, both physically and mentally. I hope you get something out of it and share the episode with any friends or family that may benefit. Apart from getting fit and healthy, more importantly, a big focus of ours should be about staying fit and healthy and doing it in a sustainable way. Today, I've invited Brad Moll, an employee wellbeing specialist, exercise scientist, and massage therapist onto the show who to, to discuss this topic. Now, he's also the founder and director of Body Mind Fit. And I wanted to talk about this topic because me, even as um, I think many people can relate to this, we've all gone through phases in our life where we we get fit, we get healthy, or we or we feel that we're getting fitter, fitter and healthier, and then things change, and maybe we could have done things differently, maybe we were doing things uh, the wrong way, or maybe they could have been done better. So, I thought Brad would be the perfect person to invite on the show to talk about this topic. Brad, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Michael, and thanks to your listeners out there. And uh, thanks to you, Michael, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm certainly going to be giving lots of tips and strategies for your listeners out there. So, um, yeah, hope it's going to be a, a great episode. Yeah, I, I can't wait. And, and 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 am I right in saying that, Brad, that a lot of people go through those phases and they they do that where they sort of, they they get really fit, they exercise, they, they join up to these maybe programs or they read something online that they start doing, but then- maybe because it's not sustainable or it wasn't done right, it sort of just falls off the cliff a few months later. Yeah. The the problem I've seen over the 20 plus years of coaching is that a lot of people, they end up still using protocols that got them fit in their twenties and thirties. And the reality is we change as we age and we lose our condition and we might have some injuries that we're dealing with or some postural um, imbalance that is created from our sedentary lifestyle. And so when they want to get back into shape in their 40s and 50s, they tend to revert back to models and training protocols that were effective 20, 30 years ago for them. But the reality, they've got a different baseline. Okay, so um, my passion and my focus is is trying to get that foundation of health and fitness really right from the start. Uh, and my background is really around cleaning up and improving biomechanics and making sure that their asymmetries are addressed and making sure that they're lifting correctly. And so once you've got that framework and that foundation correct, it reduces your chances of injuries and most importantly, creates a more sustainable path to health and fitness. Uh, So the, the problem is that there's still a lot of pressure out there when they're reading things online that they need to be constantly lifting heavier, for example. So that's the the principle of exercise science around progressive overload. And so the reality is if you're wanting to lift for 20, 30 years, people feel that pressure to continually lift heavier, okay? And that obviously can open up the chance for injuries. So it's about looking for different ways and more effective ways to exercise. And as we age, it becomes a lot more important to address recovery techniques uh, as well. So you're thinking massage, stretching, foam rolling, saunas, making sure your nutrition's on point, making sure your sleep's uh, at a high quality. So all these elements become much more important as we age. And this is a, a really foundational framework that I take my coaching clients through. Do you think a big part of it as well is because when when somebody wants to get fit, for example, well, I guess in life in general, when, when we have a problem, we all have our own ways of dealing with it. So for example, um, when somebody um, in a relationship um, has is going 
two people are having a, an argument, for example, one person's way of dealing with it is different to another. And we just have our own ways of dealing with, with issues or, or maybe or situations we're trying to fix. And from an exercise point of view, again, everybody has their own way of dealing with a particular situation where, for example, for one person, all they probably know is walking. For one person, all they know is lifting. For one person, all they know is dieting and not eating carbs and sugar, for example. And that's and that can sometimes get people to fall into not traps, but situations where they've, they've done all they really know and it's caused more issues. And there's other things that they probably didn't know about that they could have done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you've you've hit a really good point there, Michael. The reality is that everyone has their go-to exercises or they're passionate about a certain style of, of training, uh, which is great. And as long as that's serving you, that's great. I I was thinking about this before. If you can imagine you're still able to do that type of training in the next two, four, six years' time, that's probably sustainable for you. But if you're starting to get already some niggles or some injuries or you're starting to feel that your your performance and your ability to enjoy that sport is starting to diminish, maybe you need to start looking at adding in some more strength training or some targeted stability training to support that activity. Um, and yeah, I've met so many people over the years that are, are passionate about one style of, of training, um, which is great. But the reality is we do need a lot of variety in our training. Um, our body can do so many incredible things. And so you need to challenge the cardiovascular system through cardio based exercises, as well as the strength um, training is going to be really important. And especially as we age, uh, the science is very, very clear around the importance of maintaining muscle mass as we age. Um, and so also for cognitive decline, there's a lot of studies to support our mental function. You know, there's a lot more discussion around dementia. Now, as we're living longer, there's more people with dementia out there. So what can we do in our 40s and 50s to make sure that we're also working on our our brain health at the same time. So strength training, dance ex and um, coordination exercises have, have been shown scientifically to be very effective um, to improve and maintain cognitive health. And so again, that's that sustainable, sustainability and long-term path that I was talking about earlier on. Okay. And in a, apart from, of course, seeing someone like yourself, um, where, where does someone begin if they if they want to, if let's say they want to start working out, they haven't, they don't feel fit enough, or they don't feel like they're fit. Um, and I'm careful with how I say that because there's different definitions of fitness, and everybody has their own version of that. But you know, if somebody wants to get fit, wants to start exercising, um, it, what's a good not where's the best place? But I guess what's a good angle to come from initially to to look at? Is it just probably to start with what they enjoy more, or is it really to look at their situation, their age, if they've got any injuries, etc.? It's a great question. Uh, the The reality is that most people simply need to start slowly and and very gradually. So you can imagine if you're have an exercise for the last two years and you're thinking, right now it's enough. I want to get fit. Most people then immediately join a gym and they, you know, book themselves up for four or five sessions a week. When I would actually say join the gym, that's great, but start maybe with two or three sessions a week. Okay, it's really about cementing some consistency early on and trying to build that those behaviors in to support that long term health. Uh, so it's really about navigating the that managing that motivation early on. And making sure that you're just getting that consistency on uh, in early on. Um, and the other uh, big advice is accountability. So either working with a coach, telling your friends this type of thing that you're creating p uh, some social pressure, and also you're creating a partner that can assist in this process as well. So I think those are, are key markers early on. Starting small, you know, forget what you used to do. Um, you know, started at, at a much base level um, beginning and leave your ego at the door. I think that's the, a, a big advice, especially if you're used to lift and you go back and then you go straight back into the bench press or shoulder press and think about what you used to lift safely. Um, you know, leave your ego at the door, just start nice and slow and just focus on consistency and bring a friend, get some accountability, work with a coach, try and get some 
quality instruction um, as well along the way. So you're making sure that you're doing the exercises correctly. Yeah, I, I like that you said leave your ego at the door, Brad, because for me, and I did an ep- one of our episodes the other week was about Pilates, for example. And now for me, I've never really known much about Pilates. And to be honest with you, I thought it was just, I didn't even know men could do Pilates. I, mean, I knew we could do it, obviously, but I didn't think it was something that guys did. And, and j- most classes are usually primarily female anyway. But f- for me, I heard it was good. And I thought, you know what? I started doing it with my wife early in February. Um, and I had to put my ego at the door to be like, no, you know what? I've, I've gone from lifting weights when I was, you know, as a teenager um, to uh, running um, after that and doing just a lot of running um, and just doing resistance bands at home. I did that a lot uh, yeah, four or five right. years ago. And just that, you know, I'm just going to try something different. And it's literally the best thing I've ever done. You know, it's helped me out so much. I love doing it. Um, even on days that my wife is too tired to go, I still go by myself. I don't care. Yeah, you know, I just it. love it. I enjoy it, you know? And so I love that you said that leaving ego at the door and it, and it shows that it's important to try different things, not just what you're used to. Absolutely. Uh, there was an interesting article I read in the Body and Soul magazine recently that was actually saying that men are more often now going to Pilates and Christian Ronaldo made it very popular by when he was seen on his Instagram going to uh, a Pilates studio. So males are starting to understand the challenges, uh, the real effective training that that comes from Pilates and those challenges that you would have experienced early on. Um, and you, I, mean, I can imagine your situation, you're looking around and, you know, everyone's doing the exercises in some cases with these and you're really struggling, uh, certainly early on. And it's it's true. You need to leave your ego at the door. You need to tune into where you're at. Um, and if you're new to any exercise, you need to understand that it's going to take time to build up that strength and capacity um, and that control. And yeah, for sure. I tried Pilates last year for the first time. I tried a few sessions and was also impressed by the level of challenge. Um, There was some exercises that I thought were probably a little bit too extreme for the general population. So it really depends on the level of instruction uh, and just making sure that each level is uh, each level is taught at the at the capacity for that individual, um, but there's a lot of positives with Pilates. I think it's uh, there's a reason why it's a very popular and um, trending workout style now. Yeah, and and also um, I like that you mentioned going with a friend. You know, because it's we all I mean, we've all been there to be honest with you, it, or we know someone that has, but most likely we've all been there where we've bought gym membership or some type of membership, we get excited, we go for a few months, it's great, best thing we've ever done, we're gonna do this forever. And then three months later, we we stop going, or we're going once every two weeks, just because we feel guilty that we're paying for it. You know, So having that accountability, I think helps. Having a friend, someone to hold you accountable, paying a personal trainer, paying a trainer, paying someone like you, having that accountability is massive. But can I ask if somebody doesn't have a friend to go with to the gym or or doesn't want to pay a personal trainer or can't afford it, for example. Do you have any tips on how someone can keep that accountability going? Because I know there are, I've yeah. heard of, you don't need to mention names, but I know that there are a few good apps out there that help with that. Um, I had a, we, a an episode we did the other week with an exercise physiologist. He mentioned just having like a program or something to follow, like numbers or, or tracking what you're doing helps. Um, but yeah. can you provide any tips there? Because- I know you're big on sustainability and I know this this is part of it. It's a great question, Michael. And there is a lot of apps out there and ways that you can tap into technology to support your fitness goals. Um, But even just telling a family friend, you can say, you know, call up your parents or your brother or your sister or your cousin and say, look, I'm really motivated to make some lifestyle changes. I realize I've, I've lost the, dropped the ball a little bit in my exercise and I'm committed to going to the gym twice a week, starting from next week, which feeds into my next tip is around goal setting. Okay. If you don't have any structure in place, it's far easier to, to go off track. So write your goals down. And when it when it comes to goal setting, I really encourage clients to focus on behavioral goals as opposed to outcome driven goals. So a behavior goal is I will go to the gym twice a week for the next month, as opposed to I will be able to do 10 push-ups 
uh, in two weeks' time, or I will lose five kilos in the next month. Okay, so the reality is that we're not always in control of our outcomes, but if you focus on the behaviors, which is something that you can control, that is a, a by far a more successful way of building in that early consistency when it comes to starting a new program. So focusing on behavioral driven goals. And telling a friend, I mean, everyone's on social media, you can post it on, on your on your socials and saying, look, I've started this goal, I'm going to commit to this, uh, you know, I'd encourage you, you know, my followers out there to hold me accountable. So that's, uh, th there's plenty of ways to leverage accountability, and it doesn't need to cost you any money. Um, but yeah, telling someone and having some structured behavioral driven goals is a great place to start. Yeah, and no, I, I like that. That that makes sense. And 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 just telling someone, hey, I'm going to do this, and you know they're going to ask you about it. And yeah, I like that. And 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 also part of the whole sustainability side of things. There's you know having an exercise, sticking to something, doing it, making sure it's suitable for you, for your age, um, any injuries that you have, um, your budget, etc. So that's the as an advisor, I have to say that it has to be financially sustainable. Um, sure. But what else should someone consider, like uh, 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 when it comes to maybe a diet or or lifestyle, or are there any yeah. other, I guess, nuggets of gold that you'd like to share as well that you've seen? Yeah, well, for me, my framework always is holistic, holistically coaching my clients. So that means working on all these other lifestyle factors that in the end also contribute to your health. So we're talking about sleep. The sleep is getting so much recognition and awareness now which is great so sleep Im improves so many aspects of your health um, working on your, your nutrition which is when it comes to pure fat loss is is really what people need to be focused on i think that's a common misconception out there or a, a common mistake that people make when they've got those extra kilos that they think oh, i've just got to keep throwing intense exercise at there to burn those calories. Um, and the reality is if you're not addressing the additional nutrition issues that you have, um, that you can train as much as you want. Uh, so focusing on nutrition is going to be key. Stress management is also a big focus, obviously with the state of society now. So I, I encourage clients to meditate or do some journaling, spend some time in nature, making sure that they've got a good social support around them is going to be important. Um, and that ties into that accountability, making sure that you've got people around you that are supporting your healthy lifestyle change is also going to be really positive moving forward. Um, and as we age, we also know that recovery is diminished. So that relates to our ability to recover from exercise. I just read an article uh, on the weekend. For, it was an interview with um, Chris Hemsworth. And he said at 41, he now has to scale down his exercise intensity and focus on more functional style um, training and also a lot of body weight exercises. So um, the, the reality is that recovery affects us all, uh, especially as we age. So things, things again, like looking after tissue quality and, and bone health and, and things like this is going to be really important. Um, so taking regular massage, going, doing foam rolling, stretching, um, utilizing other protocols such as saunas, ice baths, these types of uh, recovery techniques, uh, which are now becoming more mainstream, which is great to see. So looking at what other areas of your health that you can work on is really a good strategy moving forward. These podcasts have been brought to you by Better Financial Planning Australia. To book a free 15-minute phone chat, visit betterfinancialplanning.com.au. Yeah, and, and actually, I'd love to briefly just touch on that as well, because I think like you mentioned foam rolling um, and, and just warming up, warming down, stretching, th things I, th I feel like they're very underrated. Um, I feel like, yes. and I just know that because, again, even, even when I used to go to the gym and do weights and stuff, it's like, no, nah, I just want to get straight into it. Uh, let's, you know, let's, let's just start lifting weights. And, and then you feel it the next day, you feel pain, and sometimes it can cause injury. And then suddenly you're out of the gym for like a month because you're you're recovering from that from that injury that potentially could have been prevented. 
you know, uh, would I be right in saying that a lot of people really overlook how important it is to warm up, to warm down, to stretch, etc.? Absolutely, absolutely. And I understand that it it requires time and effort, but I've witnessed personally in a gym uh, a client was literally sitting on the bench. They were waiting for their trainer to start and they only had a 30-minute window. The trainer called the client over and then got straight into their squats and their deadlifts and presses and what what else. And there was no warm-up. Like it's shocking for me to see. Like if I always have one-hour appointments with my clients and I would say at least 10 to 15 minutes of that is a very, very thorough warm-up routine. So uh, I would really encourage your listeners to spend that time on your warm-up. You don't need to do 15 minutes, but at least five minutes doing some joint-specific mobilization. Also have a look at what you did that day. If you've been sitting for eight hours and then you go straight away and expect your body to perform in the gym, that's not realistic. Okay. But if you've been on the go and you've been walking and doing other activities during the day, you're naturally going to be a little bit more prepared for exercise. Uh, and so definitely spending the time on the warm up is is crucial. And foam rollers are great. Honestly, they're they're hugely underrated. But if you look at a lot of professional athletes, they're using foam rollers on a consistent basis. And if if you can't afford a massage out there or a regular treatment, start with the foam roller. The foam roller really addresses a lot of the the large restrictions in the fascia and the muscles and is something that you will notice a difference quite quickly. Um, So the foam rolling, I would definitely encourage um, the the, a really good warm-up protocol and certainly some stretching afterwards. And this comes into that sustainable long-term approach Michael, I was talking about if you can really structure in even a a recovery session, you know, so if you had three sessions a week at the gym or fitness center or whatever, you would have one recovery session that could just be 10 or 15 minutes where you're doing some more mobility, you're doing some foam rolling, you're doing some additional stretching. Um, And that's really how the pros do it. They have built in recovery sessions um, to make sure that when they return to the gym, they're in optimal shape. So this is, again, something that I'd encourage clients and listeners out there to do. Um, If they they can't build it into their hectic weekly routine, and if they've only got 40 minutes, um, try and pick one afternoon or one evening. You can do foam rolling in front of the TV, um, and you can just really help to improve that tissue quality over time. Yep. Um, I I love that. I love that. And I I agree. Yes, it's boring. Yes, it's it takes time, um, but it's I guess it's like anything, you know. Pre- preparation is key and in recovery, so that you can get back into it. And and lastly, Brad, before before I, we get into a few of the exciting things that um, you're working on at the moment and what what you do as well, I really just want to ask you to highlight and remind everyone of the importance, I guess, the the, the positive impact that exercise has on us mentally. Because we all know exercise is good for your mental health. We've all heard it. I mean, I think at school, you know, they used to tell us, I used to hear it and we see it all the time in the news and TV and all the rest of it. But like, yeah, if you could just touch on that, because I'm such an advocate for that. Like this morning, perfect example. I woke up not feeling amazing. I don't know why my energy levels were just really down. Um, Went to Pilates. I've come back pumped feeling great, positive. Um, I'm, positive. I'm normally a pretty positive person, but still I was not feeling this good this morning. I'd probably say I was feeling 5% of what I'm feeling now, you know, yeah. as far as positivity is concerned. So in energy, you know, who would have thought working out would have given me more energy. Normally it's meant to drain your energy, you know? So if you could, yeah, just please touch on that probably as the last point, because for me, sure. I think it's, it's massive and you'd probably agree. Oh, I totally agree. The number of times I've seen clients come in at six or seven o'clock in the evening after a full day and they've had back-to-back meetings and they're stressed and they're tired and they can't believe they're they're still going to have a, a coaching session with me. And after 10 minutes, their energy is shifted. They've got circulation back in their body. They leave energized, motivated. And also when it comes to mental health, 
there's a reason I've my I've founded the company Body Mind Fit. The interplay between physical health and mental health is scientifically proven hands down. So any think that we can do to improve our physical health will naturally have a positive effect on our mental health. And so this is th- those worlds are already very interconnected and you gave a perfect example of that today um, that you started the day really low, went to exercise thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be a bit tired afterwards and actually left feeling even more energized and focused. So exercise is one of those things that we just need to be building in into our life on a regular basis. And we just get so many benefits and the mental benefits are huge and vast and they're very consistent. Um, And this is why I think you need to change your mindset around what exercise can provide for your health. Um, I really am a, a big proponent of exercises that support your health. So if you're going to a workout and you leave and you're feeling more depleted and 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 more drained and and you're not feeling that boost maybe you need to question if that exercise regime or that class was actually the best for you okay so um you should challenge yourself in in uh, out there but you should feel better after exercising okay so exactly your experience should be something that you want to repeat on a regular basis especially because we're dealing with so much stress on a day to day basis and if the exercise is supporting your mental health you're actually leaving the class with more focus and more capacity then to confront the rest of your day which is what we should be getting out of our exercise on a on a broad level yeah i i agree i agree and i think that applies really to anything in life isn't it like if whether it's a relationship clients employer boss friends if if anyone's draining your energy um, or anything is draining your energy, you should probably avoid it and focus on the things that give you energy. And uh, someone said that to me years ago. I've said it several times on this podcast. But to me, when I heard that, that changed everything for me. You know, and I think yeah, you've just highlighted that exercise falls into that exact same bucket. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And I, th- I, it was good you touched on the the social component, and that is one area in my employee wellbeing toolkit that I actually talk about uh, at the the reality that we need to do a social audit and look at the the friends and the and the social circle around us and are they supporting our health or, or are they hindering our health and that's a sort of a black and white reality and obviously there's a lot of gray when we're working with people um, but the reality is we need to have that that open awareness to to look around those other elements in our life and saying, are these activities supporting us? Um, are, 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 there, are we getting energy from these people? Are they draining us? These are these are important questions to have if you're really wanting to move your, your health uh, and life forward in a better direction. Yes. Well, well, Brad, thank you for the segue. Um, I'd love you to please talk about the employee side of things, because I think anyone listening to this, I, I'll, I mean, I've only briefly read about it and seen it. And from what I've seen, it like I love it. And as far as anyone listening to this episode is concerned, they're either going to be an employee or an employer. Um, and I feel like it's 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 it is a game changer, and it's something that is going to have such an impact on so many people's lives. So, if you could please just share a little bit about that as well, um, and and also how people can find out about it, um, because sure. you know, to me it seems sure. very unique. Yeah, this workplace wellbeing toolkit feels to me a summation of my life's work when it comes to coaching. I've always seen the benefits of focusing on sustainable behavioral changes. And this toolkit really is a guidebook to take you through and address and improve all those different elements of holistic health that I mentioned before. Um, The workplace is changing. Expectations from employees are, are higher now. They're expecting their organizations to do more to look after them their health. And so this toolkit is a great investment for companies that are progressive and understand by looking after their employees, the employees are going to look after the company. Um, and so it's a really a win-win. The, the employees are getting better health through this toolkit. And then there's going to be a, a positive knock-on effect through better retention, engagement, and productivity uh, in the workplace. So um, it's a brand new product. Uh, 
we're just in the the launching phase now. Um, so for those that are interested, they can contact me directly through my website. Uh, send me an email, and I can further discuss how this would be rolled out. But it's it's a completely online program, so it's it's accessible to companies all over the planet. And uh, I, I really think it's going to be something that companies are going to massively benefit from, as well as employees are going to massively benefit. So it really is a win-win on both sides of the equation. Yeah. Uh, and what I love as well about it as well, Brad, is that most people, they spend more time with their fellow employees or their employees than they do with their actual family, really, you know, because yes. of, our, of our day or rather, you know, we're sleeping for eight hours, we're at work for eight hours. And then the other eight hours, we should be with family, but really we're usually commuting to and from work. We're um, doing the grocery shopping. We're doing the other things that we need to do as well. Um, yeah. So a, a big part of it, I think, is the individual benefit, but also the group benefit in creating a more positive environment around work as well because positivity absolutely. normally creates positivity yeah absolutely and i think coming back to your point there around the 888 in an ideal world we work eight hours we play for eight hours and then we sleep for eight hours but the reality is that work has now morphed and started to take over a lot more of our time um, and obviously with hybrid working models people are coming home and logging in and still doing a couple of hours of the night time and so the workplace has an, a, a, it's, it's a, a much larger section of our life. So what can we do to make sure that that larger section of your life is actually something that's very positive? Um, and you're absolutely right. If having some positive connection and association with your colleagues um, is going to be important also for that social health aspect, which is one of the big drivers for this to be a company-wide rollout so that it's a, a exercise that everyone can engage with. And studies have sh actually shown that team cohesion and team morale and team building actually increases when colleagues can connect on material other than just um, work and, and work-related matters. So um, there's lots of different benefits um, that a toolkit like mine can be that can be beneficial for the employee as well as the company. Yeah, that's it. And and also as far as like cost is concerned, like it's as long as the benefit outweighs the cost, um, it's worth it. You know, and I've always said that to clients when it comes to financial advice, when it comes to anything, um, you know, so I feel like something like this, yes, it's a cost to an employer, for example, but if the benefits outweigh the cost, it's worth it. Like as an example, I know not all of us are millionaires, so probably um not many of us at all, um, but as far as uh, I read something yesterday, and as far as health is concerned, LeBron James, the basketball player, is thirty nine. Yes, um, which is, is is for his age to to be playing in the positions that he does and at the level that he does, like is it's unbelievable. And what I read yesterday, this was literally just yesterday, and I screenshotted it for this recording, so I wanted to talk about it, or not really talk about it, but just highlight it um, where. He spends $1.5 million per year to take care of his body. Wow. Um, and it okay. says that to maintain his physical and mental well-being. And from early morning cold plunges to pregame um, activations to advanced recovery techniques like biotherapy, never heard of it, and hyrobaric oxygen therapy. Um, yep. He's got a strict diet, organic foods, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so, so my point is that, yes, not all of us have millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, but- if we can spend the money on certain things, whether it's for our employees or for ourselves, as long as the benefit outweighs the cost and as long as it's sustainable, um, you know, financially and personally, like it's, I really think it's something that we're going to look back and, you know, when we're in our sixties and seventies or even eighties and be glad that we did what we did, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about an athlete at that level, coming back to the importance of recovery and making sure that everything is on point because he pushes his body so much to the, that, that upper limit all the time. So that ties into what I was saying and the importance of recovery. But you're absolutely right. No one can drop 1.5 each year to, to keep their body in optimal health. Uh, and so a toolkit such as mine is a one-off investment initially for the company. And it's, a, it's about education. 
It's about giving the employees strategies and tips to improve their holistic health long term. Okay, so it's a it's an initial investment, but the rewards on the other side will be significant. Um, and so I absolutely agree. I think when it comes to investing in your health, um, you're always going to get those benefits long term. And especially if it, the investment is education driven, that's that's tips and strategies that you can t- continue to use to improve your health long term. Yes, that's it. And, and I've just Googled, Brad, what a cryo chamber is. It's a modern day ice bath, basically, within yes, three minutes. Yeah, yeah. I could have touched on that. Yeah. So yeah. basically... Um, the Welsh. When I thought it, I just thought of the word "cry." To be honest with you, and I was like, "Well, yeah, this doesn't okay. make any sense." <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's actually been around for a long time, but the the point in sort of sports recovery history that made it very very famous was the Welsh rugby team that ended up going on and winning the World Cup, and they were notorious for using the cryotherapy. So effectively, what happens? It's you can imagine if you get injured, you put ice on your on your the area, the joint or the muscle that's damaged. And it helps to speed up the healing process and reduce inflammation. So he's going into these cryotherapies, which is a, a chambers, which are effectively, you know, minus 60 to minus 80 in some cases for very short periods of time. They've act- actually even got one at Total Fusion, to be honest. Um, and so you can go in there and and experience that if you're interested. And so the whole premise is that you're reducing inflammation through the, the power of, of, of cooling. Um, it's an extreme example, um, and you could imagine his tissues would be inflamed all the time with the the level of stress and load he puts through his system. So reducing that inflammation is going to be key uh, for him to to maintain his optimal health. So um, yeah, but that's that's again that's more of the advanced recoveries. But it's good that there's discussion out there, and yes, you don't need to have one of these in your uh, house, but you you can access these, um, and it's not going to break the bank completely. Uh, so you can tap into these different ways of, of reducing inflammation and recovery and performing at your best. Yes. And, and and Brad, if anybody wants to get in contact with you and to learn more about what you do and in particular that employee program, what would be the best way for, for them to do that? Um, you yeah, mentioned your I'm website earlier. Yeah. Um, bodymindfit.au. So you can go onto my website. You can fill out the contact form. I'm also very active on LinkedIn. So if you're listening out there and you want to connect and you can see my material uh, before, this is a, I've, I've already got quite a few blogs and, and posts on there as well. So um, my website's also got a lot of information if you want to have a look at some of my YouTube videos um, and other blogs that I've written. So, yeah, that's the best way, LinkedIn or through my website. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Brad. And and also, I just want to say I love your logo, by the way. So I encourage anyone to visit his website just to look at his logo at least. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty. Good... Hopefully, you stay longer than and and enjoy the logo, but enjoy the material as well. <laughs> um, and lastly, Brad, I like to finish all my episodes off with a dad joke. Um, yep. And uh, I found a couple of good exercise ones. There's, there's, there's quite a few, but um, the first okay. one is, why doesn't the fisherman go to the gym anymore? Well. Um... Too busy fishing. <laughs> he pulled a muscle. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, that is a classic dad joke. I'll have oh, to add is. that one. <laughs> oh, my, my dad jokes are classic as as classic as they get, like the bottom of the barrel type of thing. So oh that's, my goodness. goodness! I've got low yeah. standards, well, a, as you can tell. I, I think it's a good it's a good wrap up. So the importance of uh, you know doing what you can to avoid pulling a muscle, so you can stay out and keep fishing, uh, and and get back into the gym as soon as possible. So yeah, anything to avoid injuries is definitely a a good step forward. I like that. I like that connection that you just made. Yeah. Amazing. Well, and, and this is something I'm passionate about, Michael. This is which is why yes. I have a very structured assessment and coaching protocol because I I'm very passionate about my client's health and I take it that responsibility very seriously. If the client is working with me, the the, the reality if they get injured, that's on me. Okay, yep. so I do yep. my best um, each session to make sure that we can avoid injuries and they just go from strength to strength. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for your time, Brad. Really appreciate Thanks it. So and much, Michael. Hopefully people Thanks get so a lot out listening. of this as well. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us on sharing more than the sheets. Please make sure you subscribe to be updated with future episode releases and feel free to share this episode with any friends or family that you think it might benefit. Please visit us at sharingmorethanthesheets.com.au to submit questions or requests for future podcast topics. These podcasts have been brought to you by Better Financial Planning Australia. To book a 15-minute phone chat, visit betterfinancialplanning.com.au.